As you have your Bibles, would you turn with me today to the book of Luke? Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. As so many of you know, we have been in a series over the last several weeks entitled Good Versus Great. And what we've been doing in this series really is this. We've been, we've been looking at four very specific, very intentional questions that we are asking or decisions that we are making would be a better way of putting it to move us from where we are to where God wants us to be. Or we could say from the good life that we have to the great life that God wants us to experience. We kind of set the, the stage for this in week number one by asking two questions. For, first week, we said this. We said, who are you today? And we answered the question this way. We said, essentially, you and I are the sum total of our past decisions. The past decisions and choices that we have made have really determined who we are today, which led to the second question that we asked, which is simply this, who will you be tomorrow? And again, the answer is this, essentially the decisions and the choices that we are making today will determine who we are, what we become, what we're able to do tomorrow, because our choices and our decisions matter. So again, we've been making some very intentional decisions and choices in this series, and, and the choice that we're going to talk about today really needs some setting up, okay? So if you'll participate with me, if you're new with us, you're, you're going to find that I, I like group participation. It just makes it so much more fun and more interactive, and so j just participate with me, if you will. It's really no fun if you don't. Here's the question. Thinking about your own life, how many of you would say, if I just had a little bit more time... If I wasn't so busy in life, I would do the things that matter most. Let, let me see your hands. Could, could you just raise your hands up, right? Let's just, most of us, if not all of us, have our hands raised, right? I, th I think that's the reality. So many of us, if we just had more time, we, we would do or we would invest in the important things in life. I don't know what that would look like for you, but maybe for you, it would be like just taking some time to rest. Praise Jesus for the extra hour of sleep we had today, right? Right? It's the only time that I like daylight saving time, right? <laughs> when we fall back, the spring forward, not so much. Okay, anyway, right? I, I don't know if that would be for you, or maybe it would be reading, or maybe it would be investing into some relationships, or I don't know, maybe you're into gardening. There, there would be things that you would say, if I'm not so busy, if I had time, I would do these things that matter most. But most of us, if not all of us, would say, I'd like to do that, but I can't because I don't have the time. I'd like to invest in the things that are most important, but I have to mow the lawn or I have to pay the bills or I got to take the kids to any number of their like activities that they have to do, right? Or, or, or maybe it's like this. I, I, I have to get on Facebook and, and comment, make the perfect comment to that person's comment. Maybe that wasn't as funny to you as it was in my mind, but whatever. Okay. Like, like if I had more time, I would do the things that matter most, but I can't because I don't have the time, I'm just too busy. It's interesting to me, as I talk with people, as I interact with people, more often than not, when I ask people, how are you doing, or what's new in your life, what's going on, I get this response, I'm busy. How's it going? Busy. What's new? Busy, right? It's always busy, 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 very rarely, if ever. In fact, I will tell you, after the nine o'clock service, it might be the first person that I've ever met that said this, when I said to them, how are you doing? They said, I'm just chill right? Don't have a whole lot going on. Not, not really that busy at all, which is fascinating to me because I can't prove this theologically, but I heard somebody say it like this one time and I thought it was good. They said this, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. And we all just acknowledged by the show of hands that if we had more time, if we weren't as busy, we would invest in the things that really matter. To which I want to say this, and, and I promise I won't step on your toes too much today. But this one, it, it, it might hurt a little bit, okay? Because here's the painful reality. All of us, we all have time for the things that we choose to have time for. Well, truthfully, whenever, whenever we say, you know, if I just had more time or if I, if I wasn't so busy, I would do this or I would do that. What, what are we doing? We're making a choice because we have time for the things that we choose to have time for. That, that's why today I want to talk to us about how we can choose the important, the things that are important over the things that are urgent. 
Well, here's how I'm putting it. With the help of Almighty God. How many know that there's a lot of things in life we can't do on our own. We need God, right? Right. With the help of Almighty God, we're, we're, we're going to choose the things that are the most important over the things that are urgent. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. God gives me this strange ESP while I'm preaching. That's not true, but anyway, right? But, but you're thinking, wait, wait, Chris, aren't, aren't urgent things important? So, so let me take a pause here and kind of give you some differentiation between the two, because here's what I would say. Not everything that's urgent is important. I'll explain it to you like this. If you're a business owner and you have customers that are angry or upset with you, it is urgent that you address the problem, right? It's urgent that you, you, you talk with those customers, you work that out. But having systems in place, having policies and things in place to prevent people from getting angry and upset with you, I think we all could say is maybe more important, right? There's a difference between the important and the urgent. Or, or maybe another example would be this. If you have engine trouble, your car is breaking down because you have failed to change the oil on your car every three months or every 3,000 miles, it is urgent that you see a mechanic. But changing your oil on a regular basis, I know this is good preaching, okay? You can just, changing your oil on a regular basis is important to prevent your car from breaking down. Same thing goes for us physically. If we are always sick because we're running ourselves ragged, we're always going here and going there, and we don't have any downtime, we don't have any rest. I mean, after all, God rested, so who are you to think that you shouldn't, right? If we're sick, it is urgent that we go seek medical attention. But as you can kind of follow with me already, what's maybe more important is carving out times in our life to not be so busy to rest so that we don't find ourselves getting sick. What we're doing today is we're talking about how can we choose the important over the urgent. I like how Seth Gooden put it. If you know who he is, he's an author, kind of a leadership guru. He says these powerful words, I quote. He says, if you choose what is important, you won't deal with as many things that are urgent. Just think about that. If you choose what is important, you won't have as many things that are urgent. He continues though. If you only choose what is urgent, you're only focusing on the urgent, you're going to miss the things that are important. It's interesting when we look at scripture, how applicable it is to our life. In Luke chapter 10, we read a story of two sisters, Mary and Martha. Kind of sounds like a, a sitcom to me, but whatever. You know, Mary, Mary and Martha... And what, we, what we're going to see in this text is that Mary chooses something that's important and Martha chooses the urgent. And as a result, is end, she ends up being distracted from what's important. I'll show you what I'm talking about. If you have your Bibles or you're following on version Live, your talk notes, let's pick up. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 says this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he being Jesus came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Okay, let, let's kind of put this in context. Here Mary is. She's chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus because after all, Jesus is in her house. Martha, on the other hand, is freaking out, right? She, she's wigging out because Jesus is in her house, right? I mean, she's thinking, th this has to be perfect. I mean, after all, this is the son of the living God. This is the Messiah. This is the Savior. This is the Prince of Peace. This is God in the flesh, just in case we're confused on who we're talking about here. It's Jesus in her house. And so she's frantically trying to make sure that everything is perfect. Now, before we, we kind of dog Martha too much, we, we got to kind of put this in context because I don't know how it works in your life, but, but there have been times when people will maybe contact us and they'll say, hey, we're in the neighborhood. Would, what, what about if we just kind of stop by? And if you've ever had one of those moments, unexpected visitors, what do you do? You are frantic. 
You are wigging out. You're like, oh my word. You're shoving stuff under the bed. You're pushing things in the closets. You're wiping things down. You're lighting the expensive candle to cover up the smell that's normally in your house, right? You're, you're putting on the worship music so that you can hopefully bring some peace to the environment because everything's crazy. Because people are coming over. But again, this is not just Martha's neighbors. These aren't just her friends. This is Jesus. It's Jesus. And so she's freaking out, wanting to make sure everything is perfect. The verse continues. Look what happens next. As it continues, verse 40 says, But Martha, check this out. Martha was distracted by all the preparations that what? Would you say that phrase with me? That had to be made. I have to do this. I have to do that. We have to make sure that the potpourri in the bathroom matches the shower curtains because that's really important to our guests. Right? I have to do this. Look, look what happens next. She came to Jesus, and what does she do? She tattles on her sister. Right? I mean, she, she's all upset, and she comes to Jesus. She goes, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care that Mary has left me to do this all of my, all of my own? Tell her to help me, Jesus. She's throwing a fit, right? She's tattling. She's all upset. Why? Because she's so consumed with the urgent. She's so consumed with the things that had to be done that she's overlooking the fact that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the living water, the bread of life, everything that she could ever hope for, everything that she could ever desire, everything that she needed was in him. And he's in her living room and she's consumed with what's going on in her kitchen. And it's distracting her from the thing that's the most important. Which kind of got me thinking this week. If we were to take inventory of our lives, how many of us would maybe have to acknowledge that more often than not, we're, we're, we're so faithfully pursuing the urgent things in our life that it's actually causing us to miss out on the important things. Or, or maybe a better question would be this, just, just thinking to yourself, what is the most important thing that you've been distracted from pursuing? What, what, what's the big thing in your life, the most important thing? I, I don't know what it would look like for you. I'll just kind of throw some examples out. Maybe for you would say, you know what? My relationship with God is the most important thing, but I've been so busy. I have so much going on, so many preparations, all of these things, kids going here, going there, doing this, that I just don't have time to really invest into my relationship with God like I want to. The urgent is distracting you from the important. Or, or, or maybe you're a parent and you're so consumed with doing for your kids that you don't have any, any time to just enjoy your kids. You, you just, I got to get them here, I got to get them there, I got to do this, got to do that. And, and we forget that the Bible says that children are a gift from God. Last time I checked, gifts should be enjoyed, right? Just saying. Or, or maybe some of us, we fall into this category where we have become child or children-focused parents. And if you're not a parent, just hang with me. This, this will apply down the road when you become a parent, okay? But, but this is what can happen. We, we can be so consumed with their schedules and their events that it's almost like as parents, our lives revolve around them. And we neglect the marriage relationship. We neglect the time with our spouse, which can I just tell you, the marriage is the foundation for the family. You want to have healthy, strong kids you need to have a healthy, strong marriage, right? I tell my kids this all the time when I walk in the house and I'm like, where's my girl? I'm like, hey, babe. I give her a kiss and they're like, dad, it's so gross. <laughs> so you should be thankful that your dad still loves your mom like that. Amen. I mean, how can you not look at her? I mean, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> Beauty is beyond skin deep, people. <laughs> right, but, but that can happen in our lives. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe... Maybe there's an addiction. Maybe there is some habit. Maybe there's some, 
some ongoing sin in your life that you haven't confessed, you, you haven't gotten help for, you haven't dealt with because you're so consumed with, with the urgent things in your life, it, it's distracting you from investing into the important. This is where Martha's at. She's not a bad person. She's not a horrible individual. She wants, her, 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 her motivations, I think we could argue, were pure. She, she wants things to be perfect because it's Jesus. But the urgent was keeping her from investing in the thing or spending time with the one who's the most important. And so she kind of she gets all upset about it. And she comes to Jesus and she's like, Jesus. And I love how Jesus responds. Right? He, he looks at her in verse 41 and he goes, Martha, Martha. And as we discovered last night, as we couldn't help, all of us were thinking it, so I'm just going to say it. Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> right? And those of you who are like 30 and younger, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> and by no means am I equating Jesus to Jan, just saying. Okay? <laughs> Not saying that. But, but he goes, Martha, Martha. You're worried and upset about so many things. I wonder sometimes if, if that couldn't be or maybe is our life verse for many of us. We're worried and upset about so many things. There's this going on in life and there's that going on in life and there's this happening in our country and there's this going on in our world and, and that's all, all apart from all of the things I have to do with my kids and take care of my spouse and get the underwear off the floor and I mean like all, there's just so many things. I'm worried and concerned about so many things. Look what Jesus says. He says, Martha, you're, you're so upset about so many things but few things matter. Indeed, only one he says, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What do you see going on here? You see a choice, right? Mary chose the important. Martha was choosing what was urgent. See, here, here's what I hope you understand, and we're going to switch gears here for a minute, but I want you to understand this first. It is so vitally important that we get this. That when we focus on the urgent, when we're consumed with the urgent, what that does is the urgent crowds out the important. So often, when that's all we're thinking about, all we're consumed with, it causes us to miss out on the things that are the most important. That's why we're choosing with the help of Almighty God, who I believe wants us to know his peace wants us to experience his rest, wants us to walk and live in, can we say, the fullness of life that he intends for us to live. There's, there's meaning and there's purpose to your life, and God wants you to know that. He wants you to live in that. That's why we're asking for his help to choose the important over the urgent, which leads to the, the big question, how? Right? That sounds really good, preacher man. You can just preach that up a storm, but, but like, give me something practical. Give me something to, to, to set my teeth. Like, how do I do that? And so I want to I rest here for just a few moments and talk about three practical things that we can do in our lives so that we're focused on the important rather than the urgent. If you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, I would say this. We need to create artificial deadlines. Create artificial deadlines. And I'm, some of you are going like, okay, wait, time out. What is an artificial deadline? And so here's the best definition you'll ever hear in your entire life. An artificial deadline is an artificial deadline. <laughs> so profound. It's a deadline that's not real. It's, not, it's artificial, right? You say, how does that, what, what, what does that mean? Well, how does that apply to what we're talking about? Well, let me, let me put it in the context of my life first, okay? Here, here's how it works for me. What is the technical deadline that I have every week to having this message that I'm, I'm communicating, that I'm sharing with you today? When does that have to be done? What's the technical, actual deadline? I will tell you. Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
We can say that now because we're not on daylight time. Praise Jesus for that. Anyway, right? I have to be done because that's when our Saturday service starts. 6 p.m. Yes, 6 p.m. You heard me correctly. Not 6.15, not 6.30, not 6.45 for some of you. Okay, just 6 o'clock is when our Saturday service begins. So my message has to be done. But in my mind, when is the artificial deadline? If you were with us last week, we alluded to this a little bit. But for me, I want my message done every week by Wednesday at noon. That's when I, I want to be done with my preparation, ready to preach for Sunday morning. Why? Because it's a pretty important part of what I do. But there are other important things that I want to do, that I need to do. And so by having that artificial deadline, it enables me for the last 15 plus years, that, that's when my message has been done, Wednesday at noon. It, it's freed me up to be able to invest in other things that are important. You say, like what? I thought you only worked two days a week. Well, like investing into my family, investing into my kids, being there for them, investing into my relationship with my wife, investing into the leadership team of this church. Th this might seem, you might, might judge me for this, but investing into myself. Because here's the deal. If I'm only feeding and I'm not getting fed, then I'm not going to be any good to anybody, right? Right? So, so what, what has happened is by me having these artificial deadlines, it's allowed me to be more effective. It's allowed me to, to be able to free up my schedule to invest in other things that are important. How does that play out in your life? Let, let, let's just say, for argument's sake, let, let's say that you have a trip that you're going on on Wednesday. But that's the deadline. Like, like you know you're leaving Wednesday. You can't change that. It's already been sealed, right? But you know that you still have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday's worth of work to do. What are you going to do? More than likely, you're going to work really, really hard on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And the most amazing thing is going to happen. It's going to be like magic. Somehow or another, you're going to get five days worth of work done in three days. Why? Because you have a deadline. That deadline is going to make you more effective. That deadline is going to make you more productive. It's going to make you more efficient. In our lives, we can have deadlines. We should have deadlines. Like, for example, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to work out for 45 minutes instead of 45 hours like everybody else says that they're working out. But even though they're not really moving any weights, they're just jabbering with their mouth. And I guess that's working a muscle, but it's not really the muscle you should be working while you're there. Some of you got that. Anyway, right? I'm, I'm going to have a deadline so I can be home to spend time with my kids. I'm, I'm going to set some artificial deadlines, moving some things that are important into the done category so that I can invest in other things that are important. Number two, if you're taking notes, how, how do we have this meaningful life that God, I believe, wants us to have? We're going to be ruthlessly selective in our yeses. Ruthlessly selective in the things that we say yes to. I'll put it in a more spiritual context. We're going to be very, very careful and very, very prayerful about the things that we say yes to because the reality of life is this. The hindrance or the barrier to the, to the meaningful life that you long for is not the lack of commitment. It's overcommitment. What often prevents us from experiencing or living in the fullness of life that God wants for us is not the lack of commitment, it's overcommitment. There are too many things that we're saying yes to. And please understand, I'm not pointing fingers at you, I'm pointing fingers, I, I, I'm guilty, right? I, I have this tendency to perpetually be adding to my to-do list. You know, I feel like a, my to-do list never gets to become a to-done list because I'm just con continually adding to the to-do to, to list, right? I got to do this, and, and now I got to do this, and oh man, I guess I just talked to that person. I got to do this, this, and this, right? But what I'm starting to learn and discover in my life is the value of not just having a to-do list, but actually having a to-don't list. I'm going to say no to this. I, I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm going to maybe train up some other people to handle some things. Like I have teenage daughters. They can do their own laundry. Come on, somebody. That'll preach. Yeah. They can even do mommy and daddy's laundry. Come on. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, I mean there's, we, we don't have to say yes to everything. In fact, I would argue 
that there's high value in saying no to some good things so that you can say yes to better things. It's not about doing everything. It's about doing more of what matters most. And so maybe, maybe this could be liberating for some of you. Maybe it could just be encouraging that, that it's okay. If, if you want that meaningful life, it's okay to say no to more so you can say yes to more of what matters most. And then thirdly, if you're taking notes, how do we have this meaningful life? How do we invest in what's important? Focus on the important over the urgent. We're going to do first what matters most. We're going to do first the things that matter most. If we go back to the text, what was the thing that mattered most in this story? I think we could argue that Jesus articulated it perfectly. He said, Mary has chosen what is better sitting at my feet, and it will not be taken away from her. One of the things I love so much about Jesus is and as you read scripture, you read the Bible and there's the, the, there's the at face value, like, okay, this is what it's saying, face value. But I love because the Bible is living and it's active, it also has layers to it, right? And if you kind of peel back the, 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 the initial layer, okay, the most important thing is to spend time with Jesus, and that's what Mary did. We, we can kind of peel back and go, okay, but that's not just for Mary. There's a principle there for us. And essentially what Jesus is saying in this comment is this, the most important thing that any of us can do is to align our heart with the, the heart of Jesus every single day. Amen. In fact, I would argue if we're going to do first what matters most, then we align our heart with the heart of Jesus every single day as the first thing that we do. But Chris, I can't do that. Why? Because I'm tired. I, I can't get up. Well, why are you tired? Because I'm busy. Well, why are you busy? Because you're saying yes to things that you shouldn't be saying yes to. Right? I mean, here, here's, here's my take on it. If we want what's most important, we should pursue the one who's the most important first. And, and let me qualify this so, so you don't misunderstand me. Not out of legalism. Not out of, out, out of legalistic righteousness. Not out of religious obligation or duty. I'm going to say something that might mess some of you up. I hate religion. I know you're not supposed to hate. I dislike religion. Because here's the deal. To me, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with the living God who loved me so much that he sent his son to this earth to do for me what I could never have done for myself, to, to not only forgive me of my sins, to not only redeem me from all of my unrighteousness, to not only make me new, give me a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and multiple chances because his grace is sufficient, his mercies are new every morning, his faithfulness is great unto me, but also to show me that he does have a plan for my life. There is a purpose that he has for me. And if I walk with him and I talk with him and I live with him and I'm aligned with him, he will lead me in into the life that I truly desire that is only found in him because you've heard me say it before I'm going to say it again it is always it is only Jesus yeah. it's always only him and so I, I align my heart with him not because I'm supposed to not because I have to not because some bald preacher is shouting at me telling me to but I do it because I want to, and watch this, and even more so, because I need to. See, I hope, I hope you understand this. There is not a minute in our life. There, there's not an instance. There's not a circumstance. There's not a season. There's not a situation. There is nothing that you will go through, endure, or face in your life that you could come to a place and say, I don't need Jesus. The reality is we need him. I need his peace in the middle of circumstances. Come on, somebody. I need his hope when there doesn't seem to be any hope. 
I need his strength when I'm weak because the word says that, that his power is made perfect in my weaknesses, right? I need him to go before me because the Bible says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world, right? I need him to, to empower me because the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds, right? I, I need him in my life because it's only through him that I can be victorious. It's only through him that I can conquer. It's only with his help that I can overcome. It's only by his power and by his strength that I can live and move and have my being. I need him. I need his word to transform my mind. I need his presence every day in my life to bring rest to my soul. I need his Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me. I need to spend some time with him so I recognize his voice because as Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. And here's what I've discovered in life. Very rarely is it, this is God. <laughs> More often than not, it's, this is God. But I want to know his voice because I, I, I want to walk in his plans and his purposes and his will because I know that they're good and they're right and they're perfect for my life. Amen. Matthew 6.33 says it this way. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And it comes with a promise. And all of these other things will be added to you as well. No, no, notice, notice the order. Seek first his kingdom See, what, what, is, what is Matthew communicating to us here? He's saying, listen, God, God has this ability that when we put him first at the first part of our day, he has this ability to bless and redeem the rest of the day, Amen. right? And I know the argument, well, I can't put him first because I'm over 40. I have to put the bathroom first. I get it, okay? You go to the bathroom, then you put God first, okay? But, but the, like, he's okay with that. But, but, but you put him first and he redeems the rest of your day. We, we, I put God first. I spend time in his word because it's only through the power of the living word that I can set my mind on things above. I'm telling you, Chris Heslop cannot set his mind on things above, but only the living word of God can set Chris Heslop's mind on things above. Right? right? It's only as I, as I read and know his word that he can help me to think on things that are pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy yes. because I have a tendency to look on the opposite of all of those things, right? It's, it's only as I spend time in his word that I can, I can live with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. In case you don't know what that is, that's the fruits of the spirit or the fruit of the spirit doesn't actually use the plural. Anyway, right? I have to spend time in his word because I need that. I spend time in his presence because I need to know that he's with me and I need to know that he's for me. And I need to know that he, I can rely on him. I, I have to spend time in his presence because I need him to align my life with his plans and with his purposes because his plans are right and perfect and good, yes. right? Yes. People ask me all the time, why, why do you follow Jesus? Because it's just the best possible way to live, yes. right? It's the only th way that I, that I can lead, be led into life. It's only Jesus that can cross me from darkness into light. It's only Jesus that can bring me from death into life. It's only Jesus that can take me from the fallen, broken person that I am, forgive me, redeem me, and put my feet back on the path again that leads to him. Right? I, I need him. It's not just something that I want. It's not something that I do out of obligation or duty. I need him in my life. I need him. So I want to align my heart with him. Every single day. If I want what's most important, I align my heart with the one who's most important first. Every day. Because here's the bottom line. I'm going to wrap up quickly. But here's the bottom line. We can make excuses or we can make progress but we can't make both. We can make excuses. I don't have time. I'm too tired. I have all this going on. 
I'd love to invest in this. I'd love to put you first, God. I'd love to do all this, but I can't. Excuses. Or we can make progress. God, I know with, with your help and with your power, I can. I, I, know, I know that you can enable me to get up in the morning and just, just carve out. Maybe, maybe it's five minutes. Maybe, maybe it's just 10 minutes, right? But I'm just going to do this today. I'm going to spend time with you. And then tomorrow when I wake up, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to spend some time with you. Or, or maybe it's as you're driving to work in your car, you're just going to click the little play button on your version Bible app and just let that, that, that Charlton Heston voice just read over you the words of God and it just gets into your spirit because nobody has a voice like that. Right? Or maybe you're just going to pray in the shower. Yes, you can pray in the shower. It's okay. You're just going to do it. The second day and the third day and the fourth day and weeks are going to go by and months are going to go by and maybe years are going to go by and you're going to get to a point where you go, man, look how far I've come. I just started to implement a very simple principle in my life where I'm not going to make excuses. I just want to make progress. And yes, I may not be where I want to be, but at least I'm not where I used to be. I'm making some progress. Come on, somebody. I'm making some progress. I'm moving closer. I'm knowing him more. I'm understanding him more. His word is changing me and my life is different. All of a sudden there's purpose. All of a sudden there's meaning. All of a sudden there's a reason to be. I'm, I, I'm investing in the thing Things that matter most because I've aligned my heart with the one Amen. who matters the most. We can make excuses or we can make progress, but we can't make both. We have time for the things that we choose to have time for. And so here's where I'm, I'm at. I'm just, just being transparent with you. I, I, I'm at a place where I'm saying no more excuses. I'm done with the excuses. I'm, I'm not going to let my spiritual enemy Keep me so consumed with the urgent that I miss out on the important. I'm making a choice. I'm sticking my, 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 my flag in the ground. And I'm declaring that with the help of Almighty God, who loves me, who's for me, who's with me, who can empower me, I'm choosing the important over the urgent. Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. So what do we do? With God's help, what we choose the one who's most important. We align our hearts with him every single day and we let his power and his spirit enable us, help us to recognize, show us the important things over the urgent things. We seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and we let him handle all the rest. Can we just thank God that we serve a God who can handle it? Yeah. You know, we, we serve a God that, that can handle it. He, he's got it covered. He, he knows actually how to do it better than we can. Just, just saying, right? Amen. We're going to seek him first. We're, we're going we're gonna to align our heart with the heart of Jesus. Or as we talked about last week, real quick, the great I am. You know, I, I told you last week just quickly how God's been kind of taking me on this journey with this whole name of God thing as Moses learned that God's name was I am who I am. And then we jumped over in John chapter 8 last week and talked about how Jesus drew the connection of him being the I am, the same I am. And, and I got to thinking this week, you know, it doesn't even stop there because Jesus went on to say a lot of other I am passages he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Think about that. As we align our heart with the I am, Jesus, he shows us the way. He speaks truth. He brings us the life that we're truly desiring. It's through him that we have access to the creator and sustainer of all things. Think about that. But he just didn't stop there because he went on to say this. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Anyone who remains in me bears much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. Think about that. We, we want a fruitful life. We want a purposeful life. We want a meaningful life. We want a life that matters, that counts. Jesus says, here's how you do it. You remain in me, the I am. That's how you bear fruit. Jesus continued though, he said, I am the bread of life. Anyone who eats of me will never hunger again. I'm kind of paraphrasing. 
But think about that. So often in our lives, we think accomplishments, achieving things, possessions, that will bring meaning to my life. That will fill the void. That will make me happy. And Jesus is saying, listen, no, that stuff is temporary. That stuff fades away. You want to know what truly brings satisfaction is knowing the I am, knowing who you are in him, that you are his son, that you are his daughter, that you're the apple of his eye. You are his prized possession. You are his masterpiece. And he loves you so much that he's done everything for you to know him and to live in relationship with him. And it's not requirements. It's not obligation. It's not duty. It's not you fixing yourself before you come to him. It's you coming to him and he lavishes his love upon you. And the love is so extraordinary it's so unconditional it's so unfathomable fathomable that it just changes who we are and all of a sudden life makes sense and all of a sudden we realize our purpose and all of a sudden we realize that living for him is really all that matters i'm the bread of life he even goes on to say i'm the living water Paraphrasing again, that quenches the thirsting of our soul. I won't ask for show of hands, but how many of us are just thirsty for more? Just thirsty for meaning, thirsty for purpose. Jesus says, it's in me, the I am. And here's what I believe. I believe that when we come to church like this and we hear God's word, what happens is God's intent is to plant a seed into our hearts. He wants to deposit something into us that if we will allow him to, he will water it, he will cause it to grow. And, and maybe for you today, you're saying, you know what, the, the seed that God is planting in my heart is I, I just want to be that person who doesn't overlook the important, isn't just consumed with the urgent. I want to focus on the things that matter most. And with God's help, I'm making that choice. Well, I have one more promise that I want to give you because the Bible says this. He says that he who began a good work in you will also be faithful to complete it. Oh man, what if I fail, Chris? What if I mess up? See, see, the reason I'm so passionate about this is because this is a principle that I'm fighting for every day in my life. There are so many things that compete for our attention. And some days I get it right. And some days I get it terribly wrong. But I know that as I continue to align my heart with him, he will help me. He will empower me. He will enable me to realize these are the important things. These are the urgent. Here's what I want you to do. And what he starts in us, he promises he'll complete in us. And so the challenge is let's seek him first. Let's align our hearts with the one who matters most and let him handle our lives. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it is living, it is active, it speaks to our hearts, it challenges our lives, God. And Lord, I, I believe that we, your people, gathered here in your name today are saying, God, I, I, want, I want that meaningful life. I, I want to invest in the things that matter most. I, I, I want to do the things that are the most important. And, and maybe there are a lot of things in our way that are are preventing that. So God, we ask today that with your help, you would give us the wisdom, you'd give us the insight, you'd give us the ability to align our lives with you. And as we connect with you, as we tap into you, God, we know that you will be the one who helps us to, to set those, those deadlines, to, to learn what to say yes to and what to say no to, to, to be able to do the things that matter most and to do them first. And so God, we ask for your help we thank you that you were there to help us, that you were for us, not against us. You're there to help us, to strengthen us, and encourage us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do that as we seek you today, as we collectively make the decision to choose the important over the urgent. I pray that through the power of the risen Christ, you would help us, you would lead us into that meaningful life that you desire for us. Still praying for just a moment. It may, maybe some of you, the big decision, the most important thing that you can choose right now to do is to align your heart with Christ in that 
you allow him or you confess him as Lord of your life. You know, the Bible says this, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's intended desire for us. But God in his great mercy and love came to where we are. God, very God, came to us all so he could establish that relationship with us. He became our punishment. He, he died on the cross for our sins, was buried in a grave, but on the third day he rose again, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave, all so that he could offer us new life in him. And some of you today, maybe you have never, never accepted this love. You've never accepted this offer. This is what I love so much about God, and I've already said it before today, but I'll say it again. It, it's, it's not in anything that we do. It, it's in, in allowing ourselves to just simply believe and receive as we believe that he's the son of God, as we confess him as Lord of our life, as we confess our sins, the Bible says he's faithful and he's just. Confession and repentance is nothing more than just acknowledging our need of him and recognizing that he is our hope, that he's our savior. When we do that, he forgives us, he makes us new. Maybe that's where you're at. Or maybe some of you, it's, it's kind of a, a coming home. You've drifted a little bit. You've been trying to do it on your own. You're saying, I want to come back. I, I want Jesus to be the Lord and the savior of my life. I confess my need of him. If that's your prayer today, would you just slip up your hand? Is anyone here to say, that's me? I, I don't know Christ as my Lord and Savior with these hands here, or I'm coming home today. You can slip it up, slip it right back down. Here's the beauty of this moment. I believe that you're not here by mistake. That God planned and ordained that you would be here because he wants you to know his love. And as we just cry out to him in your own ways, you can do this, but I want to pray with us collectively. Father, we thank you for those individuals who raised their hands this morning. We thank you, God, that you are the living God, that you are the loving God, you are the redeeming God. And as we confess our need of you, we call upon you. You forgive us of our sins. You cleanse us and make us new. In fact, your word tells us that anyone that is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And so, Father, as they cry out to you today and say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Help me to live for you, Lord, as they, as they confess their need of you. You said that anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I pray that they would know your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. But Lord, it wouldn't stop there. It wouldn't be just something that, that, that just changes their life as far as making them right with you. But Lord, they would become a witness. They would share that hope with someone. They, they would share the love and the forgiveness that they have received and tell others that you are the hope for their lives and God, you would use them as an instrument to declare how good and great you are. Lord, we rejoice this morning with those who have found faith in you as all of heaven is rejoicing. We give you praise, God, for what you've done in our midst. And again, Lord, as we leave this place, we pray that you would empower us and enable us to be your people who carry the message and the hope and the love of Jesus into every sphere of our influence. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things.